raising visionary kids who engage the world for Christ. Join me, Dr. Thomas Lamar, on this episode of Christian Heritage On Air as we welcome author, speaker, homeschool graduate, and homeschooling father of eight, Israel Wayne, to conclude our series on raising visionary kids. For more information, visit ChristianHeritageOnAir.com. Christian Heritage On Air is a production of Christian Heritage Home Educators of Washington. This webinar recorded on April 1st, 2014. My name is Dr. Thomas Lamar. I'm a homeschooling father of seven, chiropractor by trade, a guy who loves to podcast, and your host for Christian Heritage On Air, a program which looks to encourage, teach, and inspire you with biblical vision for your family and the home education process. Well, welcome once again, everyone. Glad to have you join us for what about to be our final installment in our series entitled Raising Visionary Kids, a series that has turned out to be quite popular, I might add, and we're very excited about that. I want to encourage you to check out the other recordings that make up this series, and you can do that by visiting us over at ChristianHeritageOnAir.com. Go check them out. Download them, Facebook them, tweet them, pin them, email them. In other words, listen to them and then share them with others. Well, we want to thank those of you who have carved time out of your evening tonight to join us live. We certainly appreciate that. And we look forward to your participation in the Q&A session at the end, as well as our poll questions coming up in just a moment. Now, like I said, this is the final installment in our Raising Visionary Kids series. And this time, we get to the heart of the matter by focusing on raising visionary kids who engage the world for Christ. Our guest waits in the wings. You know, one of the reasons that we enjoy doing these live broadcasts, uh, which then get converted to audio podcasts for iTunes and then videos for YouTube, is it not only allows us to spread the message of Christian family discipleship and homeschooling around the world, but it also engages the community of our regular Christian Heritage Conference attendees by offering them an oasis of encouragement and inspiration in between the events as well as involving them in the buildup of momentum and excitement surrounding the conferences that lay ahead. And I can tell you that the buzz of excitement is in full tilt at Christian Heritage Headquarters as the final pieces are coming together for our ninth annual Christian Heritage Family Discipleship and Homeschooling Conference held, as always, in Redmond, Washington. We're just weeks away, April 24th through 26, 2014. Featured speakers include Ken Ham, R.C. Sprawl Jr., Scott Brown, Israel Wayne, and Marshall Foster. If you haven't signed up, uh, now is the time to do it. ChristianHeritageOnline.org is the website to make it all happen. You know, in previous broadcasts, I've told you how you can save one-third off of your registration. And uh, you can still do that, by the way. Uh, Time is running very short, though. This time, however, towards the end of our broadcast, I'm going to tell you how you can attend for free. (laughs) That's right, free. This special offer just became available. So uh, be listening for all the details later on in the program. And you know what? Even if you've already signed up for the conference, this offer is available to you as well. Once again, the ninth annual Christian Heritage Family Discipleship and Homeschooling Conference is on the horizon, and we're looking forward to seeing you there. Okay, before we launch into our main topic, uh, it's time to ask a, a few poll questions. And um, well, actually, these first two poll questions I want to ask, bear with us here. They may be a little awkward, at least for me, <laughs> but uh, we're asking them because we're here to serve you and we want to do our best. And the questions really have to do with a couple of features that are relatively new to our program. And uh, we're actually not going to display the answers right now, but we just want to ask these questions for you. Just go ahead and answer them. Um, And actually, for this first question, I just found out the other day that this is something that is exclusive to live attendees only. That is until we can technically figure out it otherwise. And it has to do with our live streaming video. Here's your question. Do you like seeing the video of the host and the guest? Yes, no, no strong opinion or there's a video. (laughs) In other words, do you want to continue seeing me jabber behind the mic? Go ahead, log in your answer for us if you'd be so kind. And and if you're listening to the recording or watching the video on YouTube and you're thinking, you know, hey, I'd like to see that. (laughs) Well, depending on how this answer goes, you might not. But if you'd like to join live, then surf on over to ChristianHeritageOnAir.com and sign up to be notified to attend one of our live broadcasts in the future. Okay, here's our second poll question. And again, please be be brutally honest. 
Do you like the poll questions? <laughs> yes, no, no strong opinion, or there are poll questions? <laughs> Go ahead and answer that question. And as you're doing that, I can tell you one thing is for sure, though. Our audience does appreciate the questions that they get to ask our guest in the Q&A segment near the end of the program. So if you're joining us live, make sure you get your questions into us by using the chat box on your screen. Just go ahead and type them in. And producer Danny, who, by the way, true to form, is joining us from somewhere other than his residence. Last time he was in Russia, of all places. This time, a little closer to home in Colorado. But anyway, he'll get those questions queued up and sent our way. All right. We want to thank you for your participation in answering those questions. We really do appreciate it. And I um, look forward to seeing the answers myself. But I can tell you that the Christian Heritage On Air production team will be reviewing them so we can continue to improve and serve you to the best of our ability. We do have one other question, which is uh, we will all see the answer to in just a moment. And it has to do with the content that we're delivering tonight which, of course, is raising visionary kids who engage the world for Christ. So here's question number three. just came up on the screen. And, um, you know, this is really meant for those of you who still have children living at home. Here's your question. How well do you feel you are engaging the world for Christ with your children? Very well, somewhat well, not too well, or not at all. So go ahead and answer that if you would. And, you know, I realize that this might be a difficult question to answer or maybe even to admit to um, because, you know, we can all work to improve in this area. But, you know, letting us know where you're at will give our guests a little more insight as to his audiences tonight. At least those of you who are attending live, watching us on video and answering poll questions. <laughs> okay, let's go ahead and see um, how will you feel you're engaging the world for Christ with your children as we see those come up. And it looks like... Uh, 9% of you saying very well, 57% saying somewhat well, 35 not too well, and a zero saying not at all. So that that's fantastic uh, as, as far as the last one there. But it looks like most of you are kind of feeling a little mediocre about this, and but that's okay because our guest tonight is here to help. And with that, I say we get to work. On the program tonight, as we look to raise visionary kids who engage the world for Christ, we welcome a gentleman who is not only one of our featured speakers at, for the upcoming conference, but a homeschool graduate himself. Together, he and his homeschool graduate wife, Brooke, homeschooled their eight children in Michigan. As the author of Homeschooling from a Biblical Worldview, Full-Time Parenting, A Guide to Family-Based Discipleship, and The Questions That God Asks, he has a passion for defending the Christian faith and promoting a biblical worldview. It is my pleasure to welcome to our Christian Heritage On Air Microphones, the Director of Family Renewal and Site Editor for ChristianWorldview.net, Mr. Israel Wayne. Israel, welcome to the program. Great to be with you, Dr. Lamar. All right. It is uh, super, super great to have you on. I'm really looking forward to, uh, to asking you some questions and getting to know you a little bit more. Um, you know, Israel, as you know, we just mentioned it, uh, this interview marks the conclusion of our Raising Visionary Kids series. Before we get into our area of focus tonight, which is engaging the world for Christ, I want to talk about this idea of raising visionary kids because you, like most of us listening, are currently doing your part to raise visionary kids as you and your wife, Brooke, homeschool your eight children. But in all fairness, Israel, like most of our audience, you're still in the raising part of the process. But what makes your viewpoint, your perspective intriguing is that you are a visionary kid. You are the fruit of a mother who had a vision to sacrificially lay it all down and push forward to raise visionary kids. Israel, could you please talk about her overarching vision for you and your siblings as you were growing up and how that played out? Our family was kind of unique in that we got in on the home education movement really early on. In fact, our family began homeschooling in 1978. So it was about five years out ahead of the birth of the modern day Christian homeschooling movement. And so when we started home educating, uh, we, like a lot of families, got into it for reasons other than family discipleship. In fact, when my mother first started homeschooling us, it was not for religious reasons at all. It was more for academic reasons and uh, and social reasons, I would say, um, you know, Interestingly, people raise that socialization question all the time with homeschooling. What about socialization? And she was concerned about the kind of negative socialization that my sister was experiencing in the government school. And she was uh, also concerned about the, the lack of 
good ac- academics. And so she pulled us out, started homeschooling. And uh, it really wasn't until much later that the whole idea of raising visionary kids began to emerge. My mother actually came to know the Lord when I was 12 years old. So during that time, there was a, a transition, I guess you could say, for our family. And after my mom really came to have a personal relationship with Christ, things changed pretty dramatically for our family. And at that point, we began to try to relearn what a family looked like and to begin to discover what God's purposes and plans for the family were and uh, how to live within a family culture as opposed to just having a society of individuals who all lived in the same household. Um, And then, of course, you know, learning how to reach out and to be salt and light, if you will, to uh, the world around us. Uh, That was a progress. It was a process that we began, um, had to develop in, you know, so it wasn't something that we came to overnight. It was something that we came to over time. So as, as that kind of evolved and, you know, uh, basically God showed up, Jesus showed up in your, in your lives and, and started to kind of direct those steps. As you look back, what lessons from your childhood are you now carrying forward as you raise your own visionary kids? Well, I think one of the things that we found uh, once we really did start to have more of a kingdom of God mentality as it related to the home education process, one of the things that we found was that home education inherently gave us more flexibility in our schedule to be able to serve other people. It wasn't as though we had unlimited time uh, because like family, like all families, we had uh, our own responsibilities and things that we Uh, had to be involved in, but we had flexibility to where we could shift our schedule around. And so uh, many times we would get involved in service projects and helping and serving other people because we had the ability to do it. And that was one of the things that I think I first started to see and appreciate about home education as a methodology for uh, not just family discipleship, but also for family service or family mission, if you will is that we had the flexibility if we wanted to, to just take off in the middle of a school day and go help a neighbor who was moving or serve some people who needed to be assisted in some way. We had the ability to do that because we weren't locked into sitting at a desk inside of a classroom. And so, uh, you know, the mentality of service had to happen first. We first had to have a shift in our thinking um, from it being all about us to being other centered, but the fact that we had already plugged into uh, the home education paradigm was really a blessing for us. Absolutely. I love that. <clears throat> well, now that we know a little bit more about you and where you're coming from, um, let's get into the specific topic of our program tonight, and that is raising visionary kids who engage the world for Christ. Why? Well, you know, the scripture gives us a number of different mandates, if you will, that talk about the responsibility of families to engage the world around them. And I think the first of these uh, we find in Genesis chapter 1, 27 through 28. This is where God gave the original dominion mandate to a family. You know, before there was a church, before there were any other cultural institutions, there was the first cultural institution, the first form of government, if you will, on the earth, and that was the family. And so God instructed the parents to be fruitful, to multiply, to fill the earth and subdue it. And so the caretaking of the earth, the stewardship of the earth was a mandate given to the family. It was given to parents and for them to pass on to their children. And then when you move a little bit farther in the scripture, you see that God engaged Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, and then he met with him again in Genesis chapter 18. And he said to Abraham, um, he said, I've chosen you for this purpose. And he wanted Abraham to teach and train his children that they would teach their children and so forth. And he said, I'm going to bless you and I'm going to make you a blessing. And through you and through your descendants, all the nations of the world will be blessed. And, 
you know, the thing that's ironic or interesting about that is that when you look at the life of the children of Israel, the descendants of Abraham, and you say, how well did the Israelites do in that mandate of being a light to all the nations of the world, being a blessing to all the nations of the world? It was really kind of a roller coaster in a way. I mean, they had some real ups and some downs. They had high points, and low points. Uh, but there were many points where they just didn't do well at all. I mean, it didn't take too long after Abraham until you find God's people in slavery in Egypt. And uh, it's kind of hard to be a, a blessing to all the nations of the world when you're in slavery. And, uh, you know, to kind of move that analogy forward a little bit to today, um, we kind of face that situation today, I think, where you have a whole generation of young people within the evangelical church who are walking away from the faith somewhere at or around their freshman year of college, and they're chucking everything that their parents have taught them out the window, um, that's a kind of slavery. It's a kind of bondage. And I think this home education, um, let let me change it. Let me say this home discipleship movement, because it's really not just about teaching academics at home, but this home discipleship movement, I think, has really been uh, a corrective measure to that kind of slavery, that bondage of children growing up being indoctrinated in an anti-Christian system and and walking away from their faith. And so, um, you know, today where we are, uh, God has given us this mandate that he gave to Abraham because we are spiritual heirs of Abraham. Genesis, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Galatians chapter three talks about that, where it says that if we are in Christ, then we are spiritual descendants of Abraham and we're heirs to the promise. So we inherit that mandate, that mantle that God had given to Abraham. And so Jesus said, you're the the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. And I said, men don't light a lamp and put it under a bushel, but they put it up on a stand and it gives light to the whole house. And so we today uh, are supposed to be that salt, that light, uh, to all the nations of the world. And, uh, of course, we can't do that if our salt is losing its savor, if it's losing its saltiness. And, again, I, I think that's really endemic of what's happening to an entire generation of young people who are raised in the church. I mean, the statistics we're seeing from groups like the, the Beamer Group and Barna Group and so forth indicate that two-thirds of all the young people who are still in church, their parents are making them attend church right now, They're saying, as soon as I have a choice, as soon as I have the option, I'm out of here. Church isn't going to have any part of my life whatsoever as soon as I'm old enough to make up my own mind. Uh, So obviously something culturally is really, really broken within the church. And I think we as Christian parents have got to figure out what's going wrong and how we circle the wagons, how we fix this problem, how we plug the hole in the bottom of the boat. And I think this movement back towards family discipleship is a, a big corrective there. So definitely, uh, we need to engage the world for Christ. You, you just mentioned um, two great examples in Genesis. Are, are there any other areas of the Bible that, that you wanted to flesh out that also kind of helped to support this? Well, I think one of the passages that talks about family, uh, of course, that comes to my mind is Psalm 127. And what God says there in 127, Psalm 127, is that children are a blessing. They're a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is his reward. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. Because he talks about how these are like arrows, like arrows in the hands of a mighty man are the children of one's youth. And what's interesting about an arrow is that an arrow is not a defensive weapon. There's absolutely nothing defensive about an arrow. The idea of an arrow is that it's, it's a uh, projectile weapon that goes farther than what we can go. So if you're standing in a place in a field and you shoot an arrow, that arrow goes beyond what you can do and what, where you can go. And uh, I think one of the things we have to be mindful of in terms of that releasing of the arrows is that in ancient days when a mighty man would shape an arrow for battle, he would make sure that that arrow was carefully crafted so that it would fly straight and true and he wouldn't release it. He would not put it in his quiver and release it until it had been uh, fully shaped. And 
was ready for battle, so to speak. And I think that speaks to the issue or the area of being willing to shelter children to a great extent uh, and not to send them out before the right time. But at, at the right time, fully trained, um, they're supposed to go out and do much damage to the kingdom of darkness. And so uh, I think one of the things that we can remember from, uh, say, a sports analogy is no matter how good your team is defensively, if all you have is a great defense and you don't have any offense, the best that you can ever hope for is a 0-0 tie. You will never, ever win the game if you simply posture defensively. And so our mentality as parents is, yes, there is a defensive side of parenting that we have to be mindful of, but our ultimate objective is to think offensively in terms of engagement and not in terms of retreat, if that makes sense. It does. And you uh, touched upon the word sheltering. And I, I kind of wanted to, to go down that path, if we could, a little bit more. You know, obviously, our, our program here has a heavy emphasis on homeschooling. Um, Israel, is it possible to raise visionary kids who engage the world for Christ outside of the shelter of homeschooling? Well, I think one of the things we have to be mindful of is that the scripture tells us that we have to think very carefully and wisely about the culture in which our children are raised. I mean, one of the passages that speaks to that, I think, very clearly is Ephesians 6, 4, which is directed to fathers. And it says, fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but raise them up, train them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. And that word nur nurture uh, in the Greek is the word paideia. And this word paideia is a very uh, inclusive, all-encompassing word that includes uh, everything. In the Greek culture, it included the arts, philosophy, logic, rhetoric, uh, law, um, aesthetics, metaphysics. Uh, the closest words that I can come to to describe that word paideia would be the words culture, the word you know diversity, the word academy. Uh, and so Paul is saying, don't train these children up uh, in the secular academy. Don't train them up in the secular culture. Uh, train them up in the culture, in the academy, in the university of the Lord. And, uh, and, and so I think that there, there's a, a real need to be mindful of the kind of environment they're in. And, and uh, the psalmist said in Psalm 1, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. So that question has to be asked regarding the type of education that they're receiving. What type of counsel are they receiving? We're told in the scripture to learn not the ways of the heathen. So what kind of information are they getting? What type of counsel? Is it godly counsel? Is it based in the fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom, knowledge, and understanding? Or is it humanistic wisdom? Is it wisdom that comes from this age? Is it relativism? Is it humanism? Is it hedonism? Is it teaching our children that they can live for themselves and live for pleasure and make up their own rules? And so the scripture tells us we're blessed if we avoid the counsel of the ungodly and also uh, the way of sinners. What kind of a culture, again, what kind of a social context do they have in their school, for example? If they're walking the hallways or they're listening to conversations in the locker room or listening to the students talk about the movies that they watch and the music that they listen to, what kind of a culture is that? And so we're told that we're blessed if we avoid the way of sinners. And then also we're blessed if we avoid sitting in the seat of the scoffer or the mocker. But instead of those things, it says the student's delight should be on the law of the Lord. And he should be meditating on that law day and night. And they need to have a context where the fear of the Lord is fully integrated into every single academic discipline so that they understand that the, it's the word of God and it's the fear of the Lord that is the beginning of all knowledge, not just religious knowledge, but all knowledge. And that it's a revelation of God himself. So that, that definitely speaks to the context. I think that Unfortunately, our culture, our church culture, has bought into a belief system that education is religiously neutral and that it really doesn't matter uh, what type of a context 
children learn reading, writing, and mathematics. Uh, but I think the scripture speaks very definitely against that false idea. Mm-hmm. You know, getting back to the the focus of the topic, engaging the world for Christ, that word engage, what are some of the, I guess for lack of a better word, skill sets that our children need in order to, you know, offensively go out there and engage the world? I think one of the things that they need to be taught is they need to be taught how to reason. They need to know how to see the foolishness of this age and how it's coming to nothing need to be able to recognize fallacies. They need to be able to recognize error. Uh, and of course, part of that is having them grounded deeply in the truth, uh, teaching our children to know what is true. I think sometimes as Christian homeschooling families, we put so much emphasis on academic knowledge and information, and knowledge and information has its value. Uh, but wisdom is really being able to take that information and know how to apply it practically to the real world. It's knowing how to use information in a way that um, pleases God and loves and serves other people. And so I think uh, teaching logic, teaching reason, teaching, um, pe- teaching young people how to understand Christian apologetics, how to defend the faith, I think that's so important. And So there are several things that I teach families when I talk to them about equipping their children with a biblical worldview. Um, I talk with them about the importance of of knowing that everyone has a worldview, regardless of whether they realize it or not, uh, regardless of whether they even know what the term worldview is or what it means. We all have a set of lenses. We all have a certain way that we view life, a filter, if you will, through which we view all of life and reality. And that worldview is either going to be a biblical worldview where we see things through God's lenses, we see things accurately and the way that they really are according to the truth, or we're seeing them through a false set of lenses, a set of lenses that have been tainted and distorted by error uh, and by the false ideologies of this world. So helping our children to see that uh, epistemologically the basis of truth always begins with the nature and character of God. He's the plumb line through which we understand everything that is right and is true. That whole kind of Philippians 4.8 thing of focusing on what is true and right, good and beautiful and so forth. And so, first of all, understanding that everyone has a worldview and our worldview needs to be informed by the scripture. And then secondly, we need to teach our children what to believe. And we need to know what our children believe. Uh, I know sometimes parents um, like I said, they test their children academically with standardized achievement tests and so forth to test their students on what they know informationally or academically. But I think many times they don't actually know what their students believe. They don't know what their convictions are. And so on issues like social issues or politics or education or economics or, or uh, religious studies, whatever, they, they don't history. They don't know what their students believe about those things. They don't know what their core convictions are. And I guess I'd like to suggest that I think it's a lot more important for you as a parent to know what your children believe than to merely know what they know, if that makes sense. Oh, absolutely. So, um, and so the, keep going. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I think another aspect of all of that is, you know, not just teaching our children what to believe, uh, because sometimes I think parents do that. They tell their children abortion is wrong, and they tell them, you know, any kind of uh, sexual relationship outside of marriage is wrong. And so sometimes they're pretty good at giving their children a laundry list of do's and don'ts. But I think another thing we need to do is we need to teach our children to understand not just what is right and what is wrong, but what makes something wrong. How do we know that our beliefs are true and that the opposite or the antithesis of our belief is false. And so that's something a student needs to understand. If he or she doesn't understand that, then uh, I think they're ill-equipped. And what will happen, in my view, is when they go out into the quote-unquote the real world, they they go out into uh, the workforce or if they go to college or whatever, and they're exposed to a different ideology, they're exposed to different belief systems, their belief system can fall apart if they haven't learned how to defend their views, if they haven't learned how to defend 
their uh, Christian worldview. And then uh, in addition to that, I think also um, teaching children how to articulate their faith is important. The children need to learn um, not only what they believe, and they need to learn not only why their beliefs are true, but I think they also then need to learn how to communicate to other people. And there are two major areas where I think this is important. Parents need to learn to teach their children how to uh, communicate well through written communication and also through verbal communication. Because if your children can write well, if they can speak well, then they will have the ability to influence other people. It's one thing if your child knows what he or she believes, but if they don't have the ability to articulate it, if they don't have the ability to defend it, even in a hostile environment, then that information may be sufficient for them, for their own personal salvation and sanctification and so forth but it's not going to be sufficient in terms of them being world changers, in terms of them influencing the culture, in terms of them really being the light uh, that they should be. And and then I think another aspect of this that really needs to be uh, taken into consideration is the whole aspect of of living what they believe, living their core convictions consistently. And uh, we've seen examples even recently of Christian leaders who have um, spoken uh, some some great truths, but in their own lives, they fail to live out the truth. And uh, whenever that happens, of course, um, that's just a terrible testimony for the, the name of Christ and the, the cause of the gospel. Uh, people point at these individuals and say, well, see, uh, they're all just hypocrites and Christianity doesn't really work and all that kind of thing. So integrity, I think, and character and being willing to live out consistently our beliefs in front of a watching world is paramount. It's not enough for us to just go around and and spout off and espouse proper doctrine, as important as proper doctrine is, uh, but there also needs to be an embodiment of that. There needs to be uh, some type of example of that to the watching world that they can look at our lives and they can see, uh, particularly in community, uh, I think when they see in family and when they see in communities of families, people who collectively together are trying to walk out uh, the embodiment of the, the, this truth, of, of these didactic precepts and principles, I think that impacts people. And I, I think it, they will, I think Christianity would be far more compelling if people actually saw families and churches full of families consistently living out their faith without compromise. And I believe that's the, the direction, that's the trajectory that the Lord wants us to go uh, as a homeschooling community. I think the, the church is really the future frontier, if you will. It's a, a whole area that um, still, still remains yet largely unreformed. God is reforming the family, but I think there's a great need for uh, reformation within the church. And uh, that may be the next frontier in the next 20 years. Mm. Yeah. Um, before I introduced you, uh, I asked in our final poll question, uh, how well do you feel you are engaging the world for Christ with your children? Um, this idea of living your convictions, uh, what does it mean to engage the world for Christ with your children? What does that look like? Well, um, let me just rewind a little bit, and I'll go back to uh, when I was 15 years old. Uh, when I was 15 years old, um, we were trying to still put the pieces back together of our family and learn how to be a normal family because we, we didn't really know how to do that. I was a very social young person. I was very caught up in the youth culture, uh, the pop culture, or if you will. I was not part of the family culture, and um, I remember any opportunity that I could find that would get me away from my family, that would get me out of the house, uh, I was excited about that opportunity. I remember our church youth group was going to go on a short-term missions trip, and uh, it was very costly. I think it cost several thousand dollars per person for airplane tickets and hotels and all the expenses of going to another country and being gone for two weeks or however long it was going to be. And I remember I came to my mother 
And I said to her, I really believe that God is uh, leading me to go with this youth group from our church to go overseas and, and uh, serve, you know, serve the Lord overseas with the short term mission group. And my mother said, it asked me a question. She said, do you, do you love those people overseas that you're going to minister to? And I said, yes, I, I think I do. I, I really think I do. And she said, um, what country was it again? And I said, um, oh, I can't remember. Uh, someplace it's in Africa or South America or I don't know, India or Thailand or someplace like that. I don't remember exactly, but, you know, someplace far away. And she said, so you, you really love these people then, right? And I said, yeah, yeah, I sure, I sure do. And she said, well, you know, that's just kind of ironic to me. Um, because you're talking about going and, and serving other people. And she said, I, I just don't see you walk that out here. She said, I don't see you loving and serving the people that you interact with every single day. And she said, you have five sisters. I don't see you loving them. I don't see you serving them. And uh, she said, and yet for some reason you're going to go and, and try to be an example to people across the world that you don't even know in some country that you don't even remember. And, uh, and she said, and, and you know, what, what exactly uh, do you think they would find in your life that would be compelling to them? Um, she said, I mean, are you going to teach them how, how they can have their bedroom look like your bedroom? Of course, at that time, you know, as a teenager, my bedroom looked like an atomic bomb had dropped on it, you know, and, and uh, she's like, are you going to go over and, and kind of teach them how, how they can you know, have your, uh, your skills of, you know, relationship skills? And so, <laughs> I don't know, it's kind of a really awkward and, and humbling conversation. Uh, but the point got across to me, and it was that, you know, the people that God has put in front of us, right, in front of us that we see every single day, those are the people we need to learn how to love the most. And um, the reason I share that is just to say that, I think a lot of Christian parents have a mentality when they think of training their children for service, they have a mentality of, oh, there's a short-term missions trip and they're going overseas. This would be a great opportunity for us to take our 15-year-old, put him on an airplane and let him go to the other side of the world and serve somewhere. And uh, I'm not against short-term missions trips, but I think that the ideal would be first and foremost that they learn how to love and serve the people who are closest to them. You know, that whole missionary thing that, that God gave when, you know, when Jesus gave the great commission and he talked about Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the world, there's kind of this inner circle moving towards an outer circle. Um, I would like to see families put an emphasis on uh, not always thinking of service as being uh, on the other side of the world, although there's a great need for that, but beginning where you are and then when you go out from there, when you expand out from there and you do take those short-term missions trips or long-term missions trips or whatever overseas, or you get involved in tsunami relief or you go you know, build a church building in Kenya or India or wherever, um, my suggestion is rather than sending your children or your teenagers off uh, to go serve the Lord, that you lead them. I mean, that really is the whole concept of discipleship is that the student is being trained. And Jesus said, when a student is fully trained, he or she will be like his teacher. Uh, and so I really think that that is the goal of family-based discipleship, that you don't merely send your children overseas uh, or into some kind of a service capacity where they're once again just removed from the family, but that you lead them and that they learn how to love and serve people by watching your example. I think it's far more contagious I think it's far more effective, and I think that in the future, you're less likely to have them view you as a hypocrite, you know, view you as somebody who told them to go and serve, but you didn't do it yourself. And I just know that uh, God, as a pattern, uh, wants us as parents not to just send our children into missions, uh, but to lead them. And, and I think that's completely doable, again, especially with the homeschooling lifestyle. Uh, we just have a freedom and a flexibility there that's intrinsic within the home education model uh, for doing that. 
leading your children. Um, one of the things that is important when you lead anybody is uh, kind of showing them where you're going to go. And uh, I know you like to talking about mission statements. As we wrap up this portion of our program in raising visionary kids who engage the world for Christ, talk a little bit about the importance of a family mission statement. Well, you know, one of the things that I like to do with my children, with my boys, um, they're really into archery right now. And, uh, you know, when, when we go out and we shoot a bow and an arrow, um, one of the things that I, I love about that whole endeavor is that every time I pull back the bow and I release that arrow, I hit something. And so it's, it's a wonderful exercise because I find it's great for my self-esteem. You know, 100% of the time, I'm successful. I hit something every single time. Uh, the difficulty comes when we put up a target. When we put up a target, then all of a sudden, uh, well, my self-esteem plummets quite dramatically. Uh, but I think that can be true for us as parents. And I think one of the things that we need to be mindful of as Christian parents is that every single day of our lives, we're hitting something. We're hitting some kind of a target. The question is, is it the right one? And I'm surprised sometimes how many parents go through life and go through the education of their children without having a clearly defined goal. They don't know exactly what it is that they're setting out to accomplish, or even in homeschooling, why they're homeschooling. Sometimes I think, again, they just started out because they had a bad experience with the school, or they thought their kids could get better grades at home, or something like that. And, and maybe that's not even why they're homeschooling uh, today. They've shifted reasons and they haven't even realized it. But I think um, having a clearly defined goal, having a clearly defined mission is so important. And so in this mission of being a family, I think what, uh, what we've done as a family is we try to bring it down to the, the core basic elements, the irreducible complexity, if I can call it that. You know, the, what, what are the basic essentials of who we are as a family and why we are here? And I believe it's this. I believe it's number one, we're here to know God. I don't think there's anything more fundamental or foundational than knowing God. Uh, Jesus said in John 17, 3, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So knowing God is the foundation for everything else. But when you come to really know God, when you know him as he is truly, not the God that you want to be there, not the God of our imagination or, you know, the big Santa Claus in the sky or whatever kind of misconception we may have of God. When you really come to know God as he truly is, then uh, you, you can't help but have a sense of wonder. You can't help but have a sense of adoration. And so the, the second component of that is loving God. Jesus said that we're to love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And uh, when you love God, you have that response uh, that Isaiah has when he saw God in Isaiah 6 and he saw the holiness of God. He was just overwhelmed. And uh, his response was to say, here am I, send me. And so the, the next component of that, I think, is service. That when you know God and you come to love him, then you want to serve him. And I think it works in that order because you really can't serve effectively without love. And so loving God is so important, but you can't love somebody you don't know. So knowing God, loving God, and then serving God. And of course, how do we serve God? Well, the primary way that we serve God is by loving and serving other people. And that's that whole component within the great commandment of loving your neighbor as yourself. And so from my viewpoint, everything and every uh, facet of our lives, every sphere of our existence should conform to a mission statement that's somewhat akin to our family's mission statement, which is we exist to know, love, and serve God, and love and serve other people. And if we're not being motivated by that, if we're being motivated by some other motivation, then I want to suggest that I, I think that motivation is probably self and indulgent, self-focused, and humanistic. If it's about us, if it's about our success in life, if it's about becoming wealthy and acquiring things and being comfortable and all of that, 
Um, that's really not the gospel. That's really not the kingdom of God. That's not what we've been called to as disciples. And so for me and for my family, uh, we really want to make sure that everything we do is motivated out of a desire to know God better, to love him better, to serve him better, and to love and serve other people. So for us, this whole process of home education, all the tools that we bring into this process, academic tools, parenting tools, discipline tools, um, informational tools, whatever tools we bring into this process, the, the ultimate house we're trying to build is a house of knowing, loving, and serving God and loving and serving other people. And uh, in order for our children to grow up and love and serve other people and serve Christ, they're going to need to know how to read. And they're going to need some math and they're going to need to know some science and history and so forth. But all of these subjects are, are means. They're not an end. And I, I think that we get really confused as Christians sometimes about the difference between ends and means. And uh, academics, it's just a means. Um, a scholarship to college, that's just a means. A college degree is a means. A job is a means. Finances, money. That's a means. All of those things. A car. That's a means. Uh, but are, what are they means to? They're either means for loving and serving ourselves, or they are means for loving and serving other people. And one of my concerns about the Christian home education movement is that there's so much focus on academic superiority, on our children doing better academically and having higher achievement tests than uh, their publicly schooled counterparts. There's so much emphasis on equipping our children and training them to be good entrepreneurs and to uh, do well in the business world and make lots of money and get college degrees and be financial successes. And I guess what I wonder is just how much of all of this is chasing after the American dream and how much of it is actually just necessary means for equipping our children to live within the kingdom of God and love and serve God and other people. And so my view is uh, I really hope that we as home educators, Christian home educators, are known not merely for wanting to retreat from the world, not, not being known for trying to escape from society and escape from civilization and all the bad things that are out there in the world and trying to protect our children from all the bad things. Although there are a lot of bad things that we do want to protect our children from and unashamedly so. Uh, but I think that, you know, from my viewpoint, um, the scripture tells us don't be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. And James tells us, you know, that pure religion un and undefiled is this, it's to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. So there's that sheltering side again. But it also is caring for widows and orphans in their distress. And so I hope that we won't be overcome by evil. We'll have that proper protecting, sheltering, nurturing kind of atmosphere for our children. So they're not overcome by evil like the vast majority of young people in the Christian world today are. Uh, but that we will overcome evil with good, and that as Christian homeschoolers, we'll be known for our love, we'll be known for our service, we'll be known for engaging the culture together as families. Again, not just sending our children out to do it, uh, especially when they're young and ill-equipped, but leading them and doing it together uh, as a corporate family unit. I think that's powerful. I think the world hasn't yet really seen that in our generation. They used to. Uh, but I think it would speak really powerfully. I think it would be a compelling argument, a compelling apologetic for the gospel, if we could see that uh, in, embodied within our community. What a vision. Israel Wayne, a visionary kid all grown up and now raising visionary kids of his own who engage the world for Christ. Thank you so much for taking time out to share and encourage our audience tonight, our audience, of course, that is live with us. And, you know, and the ones that will catch this in the days and months and years down the road. Speaking of our live audience, uh, before we start fielding questions from them, uh, Israel, I mentioned in your introduction that you are the director of Family Renewal. Just real briefly, tell us more about that. Family Renewal is uh, an organization that my wife and I founded uh, with one of my sisters, and 
uh, we have been going across the country and doing a seminar called Revival in the Home. It's not a homeschooling seminar, but it is a seminar that really builds a teaching of what is a biblical theology of the family. What is the family supposed to be and look like? What is the responsibility of the father? Uh, what is uh, a biblical view of child training and child discipline? And uh, what are some mistakes that Christian parents often make that sometimes uh, result in them losing the heart of their children? And so I speak at homeschooling conferences around the nation, uh, but I also am, am carrying this revival in the home seminar into churches. So if somebody has an interest in bringing a family discipleship seminar to their church, I would encourage them to contact us. Our website is familyrenewal.org, and uh, they can get more information on that. Uh, we also do different types of events. Um, apart from that, we speak at lots of family camps and uh, seminars, conferences, um, marriage retreats, um, you know, lots of, of different events. One of the other seminars that I do is on Christian apologetics, where I teach sessions like, how do I, how can I know what is true? How do I know the Bible is true? Uh, I do sessions on uh, relational apologetics, you know, how uh, to defend the faith in a context that isn't antagonistic and, and uh, it doesn't turn people off. Uh, and then also evaluating the arts and entertainment from a Christian worldview. Uh, so those are just a few of the things that we do uh, through Family Renewal. And I just encourage people to visit us on Facebook. We have a Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash family renewal and also um, familyrenewal.org to plug in and learn more about what we do. Okay. Well, it is no surprise that you are one of our featured speakers. I've mentioned a number of times um, for our upcoming 2014 Christian Heritage Family Discipleship and Homeschooling Conference. Um, Danny, I'm hoping that you can throw a slide up. Israel, can you give us a quick uh, snapshot or a, a quick little elevator speech as to what you'll be sharing? Yes, I'm going to be talking about uh, Christians and pop culture, evaluating the arts, again, from a, a biblical worldview. Uh, that's always a really engaging one for uh, both teenagers as well as parents. Uh, what about socialization, which is probably the most commonly asked question when the topic of homeschooling comes up. I take a little different slant with that. I actually go back and trace the history of the theory of social education. Where did the idea come from that children should be in a classroom with 30 to 40 other students all the same age in, a, in order to be properly educated and socialized? And uh, I actually have a really fascinating historical overview of where that idea came from and actually why that theory is dangerous, actually. you got to listen to the seminar. Uh, uh, it's, it's a fascinating workshop. And then uh, Inside the Brain of a Hyperactive Homeschooler, that's kind of autobiographical. I'm helping uh, talk to parents who have children, perhaps who have been labeled as ADD, ADHD, trying to provide some help and hope and direction for them. Uh, the family culture, uh, talking with these families about, you know, how to uh, circle the wagons. You know, if you've got a situation where your young people are drifting away from the family and they're just engaging very heavily in the pop culture and all that, how do you get the family back together as a unit, uh, especially when there's such a pull from the world there? Uh, being salt and light families, talking about evangelism and our need to reach out to the world around us. And then uh, developing public speaking skills is a message uh, that I'm doing because I have a lot of people who, who say, you know, my child, I would like my child to learn how to speak publicly, um, or maybe they even feel for themselves that they want to improve their ability to communicate. And so I talked about some real practical how-to suggestions for people who want to uh, do platform public speaking or, or even just to improve their communication in general. Uh, sounds like you're going to be bringing some great information to the Christian heritage community. Um, I'm looking forward to it. Israel, go ahead and sit tight for just a moment. Take a breather. We're going to set the table for our Q&A with our live audience. Uh, live attendees, this is your last minute call to get your questions in and a chance for me to tell you about some things that are coming up. And well, one of the things that's coming up is the conference. And uh, yours truly is super excited to be moderating two separate panel discussions during the workshops. And uh, now... I've checked the schedule, and it is true that I'm going up against some of Israel's sessions. But hey, that's why Christian Heritage has CDs to purchase, right? <laughs> 
But anyway, my first panel I want to tell you about is with a group of young ladies and is entitled Pursuing Life's Opportunities. Come here the various ways young unmarried ladies are currently ministering to their families, reaching out to the needs of others and pursuing personal development. This session will be all about encouraging young ladies to maximize their time at home. That's on Friday. And then on Saturday, I'll be flipping the coin and talking to a group of young men about their pursuits in employment and business. Uh, In this session, you're going to have a chance to glean wisdom and ideas from the experiences of young men who have purposely sought to use their God-given skills and abilities in the area of employment and business. The session will look to encourage young men to maximize their time to prepare financially for the future and to rally them to action. (laughs) <laughs> those, sound, those sound pretty great. I can't wait to attend. Of course, uh, we will set aside some time to field questions from the audience as well. So uh, love to have you attend one or both of those sessions. And um, if you do, please make sure uh, you stop by and say hello. Um, in other news, this will be our last Christian Heritage on air before the conference, (laughs) but the mics come back on June 3rd, 2014. Plan on joining us as we debrief from the Family Discipleship and Homeschooling Conference and then look ahead to the Family Relationship Conference to be held in Ocean Shores this fall as we welcome keynote speaker Lou Priolo, who will be talking about how to deal with disrespectful teenagers. You can find out more information over at ChristianHeritageOnAir.com. And then finally, I teased it at the beginning, how can you attend the upcoming Christian Heritage Family Discipleship and Homeschooling Conference for free, even if you've already registered and paid? Well, it's pretty simple, actually, and it's made possible by our conference sponsor and good friends over at Samaritan Ministries. Simply join with the now 33,000 plus families over at Samaritan Ministries who are fulfilling the law of Christ by bearing one another's burdens when it comes to financial health care needs. Exempt yourself from the penalties of Obamacare. Become a new Samaritan member anytime between March 24 and July 1, 2014, and Samaritan Ministries will reimburse your 2014 Christian Heritage Family Discipleship and Homeschooling Conference registration fee. Pretty cool. We have more information over at ChristianHeritageOnline.org. Okay, it's time now for our Q&A with Family Renewal's Israel Wayne on raising visionary kids who engage the world for Christ. We're going to see what questions are coming in. And um, here's one right here. Israel, you said, um, quote, "It's, it's hard to be a blessing to the world when you're in slavery. So, so question here is, in what ways are God's people enslaved or in bondage today? And how might God's people recognize if they are losing their, their savor? Excuse me. Go ahead. Yes, yes. Great question. Well, I think when you look at the statistics that are coming out from groups like Barna.org, Pew Research, the Beamer Group, Nehemiah Institute, Josephson Institute of Ethics, etc., uh, books like Ken Ham's book, Already Gone, Josh McDowell's book, The Last Christian Generation. Uh, basically, the statistics are that of the young people who are still in the church, uh, only about 9% of them have a biblical worldview. Uh, that's according to Barna. And, you know, his standard for having a biblical worldview is not very rigorous. I mean, the questions he asks regarding a biblical worldview are, do you believe that Jesus is the only son of the true and living God? Do you believe Jesus lived a sinless life? Do you believe he was born of a virgin? Do you believe that he died and rose again? Uh, Do you believe the Holy Spirit is a real entity? Do you believe Satan is a real entity? You know, those kinds of questions. Uh, Do you believe the, the Bible is the inspired, infallible, inerrant word of God? I mean, these are questions that I would say just basically define uh, an Orthodox Christian in terms of their theology. You know, this is just you uh, aligning with an Orthodox Christian statement of faith. Um, but so that's the standard he would say. If you if you can affirm those statements, you have a biblical worldview. He's saying that of the young people who are still in the church, only nine percent of all church youth will affirm all of those statements. Um, that sounds like slavery to me. You know, intellectually, um, they have been taken captive. Instead of taking every thought captive, making it obedient to Christ, their minds have been taken captive by the enemy, and they have believed the lies of this world. And uh, the latest statistic that I saw of um, those who are in America between the ages of 18 and 25, those millennials uh, within that age group, um, the statistic is less than one half of one percent hold to 
uh, biblical worldview. In other words, less than one half of 1% of all 18 to 25 year olds will affirm uh, those statements. And, uh, you know, that's less than any nation in the world that I'm aware of. I don't know of any communist nation or any Islamic nation that has less than one half of 1%. I mean, I think Japan is right about there. Uh, but it's, uh, you know, to me, that doesn't sound like uh, victory. That doesn't sound like the promised land. To me, that sounds like being stuck in Egypt. Okay, here's another question. What is the role of the church in disciplining children who have non-Christian parents? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Let me try that again. What is the role of the church in discipling children who have non-Christian parents or single parents? Well, that's a good question. I mean, the scripture doesn't really speak to that. I mean, it tells us to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and uh, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever he has commanded us, whatever the Lord has commanded us. And so in that sense, can that include children? Um, I think it can. Um, I, I will say uh, on the downside, you know, if I can be negative for a minute, um, we've seen... 60, 70 years, actually right after the Civil War uh, in America with D.L. Moody was when the Sunday School movement grew here in America. Um, so we've, we've had a good long 150-year run of this, but um, particularly within the last few generations, let's say 50, 60 years, we've had a really extensive children's ministry movement within America. And um, when you look at the numbers of young people who are walking away from the faith, I mean, the Southern Baptist Council on Family Life says 88% of all their youth leave the church somewhere around their freshman year of college and say they're never coming back. And the Southern Baptists have one of the largest Sunday school movements in the world. I mean, they, they practically franchise the thing. And so um, I guess what I would say is I would say it's, it's not working by, by and large. Um, now, with that said, you know, um, I will also say I worked as a chaplain in, the, in our county's juvenile center for six years. And um, I was always grateful when there were students who had spent some time, at least in Sunday school or VBS or something like that, because they at least had some basic knowledge of the scripture that we could build on as we were trying to evangelize them as teen teenagers. Uh, if they knew nothing of the scripture, uh, then you're starting from scratch. And it's really difficult when you have a very limited time in that capacity. So um, has God used... Uh, outreaches to children uh, by the church over the last 150 years? Certainly. Have people been saved? Absolutely. Um, has it been a phenomenal, overwhelming success? I think by any reasonable benchmark, we would say no. Uh, we're thankful for the people who have been saved. We're thankful for the grace of God and how he has blessed it and used it. But I think um, more fundamentally than that, and this is, I used to work in children's ministry and I worked in youth ministry. And because of working in children's ministry and youth ministry and seeing the real difficulty uh, of us trying to, you know, spend one hour a week trying to reform a student who's getting 14,400 hours of, of secular anti-Christian indoctrination in the government schools between kindergarten and 12th grade, uh, we just couldn't compete. And um, so... I felt like God wanted me to shift my focus to ministering to the family and trying to teach the family together as a corporate unit how to walk together in God's way. Just like Joshua, where he says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Or Cornelius, him and his house, uh, being, believing and being baptized. Um, I want to try to reach the parents and have them bring the children along with them, as opposed to going around the parents and trying to get to their children just because I think it's a more effective approach. Um, I'm not down on people who feel called to children's ministry. If God's called you to do that, hey, do whatever you can find to do, do it with all your might, do it for the glory of God. Uh, I'm just saying that it hasn't been an overwhelming success, and uh, we, we need to find a way to bring the whole family uh, into the ark, if you will. Okay, we have time for one more question here, um, and here it is. I have older teenagers. How can I know and make sure they are equipped to engage the world and hold to their Christian faith? 
Well, I mean, here's one tool that I recommend. Uh, I recommend the PEERS test. It's an acronym. It's P-E-E-R-S. It stands for Politics, Education, Economics, and Religion and Social Issues. It's a biblical worldview assessment test that you can have your children take. You can find out about that at nehemiahinstitute.com. Uh, there's also great organizations like Worldview Academy, Summit Ministries that have both curriculum as well as events that young people can be a part of. But essentially, um, you need to have conversations that count. You need to ask them questions. You need to know what they believe, uh, know their convictions. And um, I would strongly encourage you to make sure that you uh, have them trained in Christian apologetics so that they know how to answer those who are going to be antagonistic to the Christian faith. Uh, one website that I would direct you to is my website, ChristianWorldView.net christianworldview.net. I have a blog on there as well where I write a lot about Christian apologetics and biblical worldview. So um, check out christianworldview.net as well. And my book, uh, Homeschooling from a Biblical Worldview, that book is going to be phenomenal in helping you as a parent to know how um, to teach your children, knowing if you're covering the things that they need to know to be equipped for the real world. Excellent. All right, Israel, I want to thank you so much for joining us tonight. What a blessing this has been. And just as an aside, my wife, who is sitting right by my side here in studio, she would just like uh, really to say for you to give your mother a great big hug and kiss, because for the last 15 years of your mother's publication um, of an encouraging word, she has been tremendously blessed by her love and wisdom. Wow. Well, what a blessing. I'm so encouraged to hear that. And, uh, Thank you, uh, Mrs. Lamar, and uh, thank you, Dr. Lamar, for inviting me on the show and for Danny, and uh, I'm really excited about being part of the conference. I've never spoken in the state of Washington before, and so this will be my very first time, and I'm just uh, really super excited about being part of this conference. Well, we're uh, looking forward to having you here. As we wrap up our program tonight, uh, give us a final thought when it comes to raising visionary kids who engage the world for Christ. I would just encourage parents that God never calls you to anything that he won't equip you for. And this may seem like a daunting task to try to raise a world changer, to raise someone who can impact nations and be a blessing to all the nations of the world. You may feel like, you know, right now my children aren't even a blessing to the neighbors. In fact, half the time they're not a blessing to me. I've got a long way to go. Uh, But I want to encourage you that it's it's a marathon. It's a process. It's not a hundred yard dash. And uh, God has given us these children, uh, and we have every single day to make those little choices that add up to big things. So stay strong, and uh, you'll see the fruit in the end. All right, everyone, that music is a sign that this episode of Christian Heritage on Air is coming to a close. Once again, I want to thank our guest, Mr. Israel Wayne, for joining us on the program. Thank you, Israel. And uh, you can find out more about Israel Wayne over at familyrenewal.org. And as a reminder, Israel will be at the upcoming Christian Heritage Family Discipleship and Homeschooling Conference, and I'm sure that he'd be delighted to meet you in person. ChristianHeritageOnline.org is the website to get you dialed in and signed up. And I want to encourage you to keep in touch with us, with your feedback and comments over at ChristianHeritageHeritage.com. We're here to serve you as you move through your family discipleship and homeschool journey. Thank you to producer Danny running the webinar, and thank Thank you to my wife, Carrie, for helping me here in studio. And thank you to everyone on the board for this fantastic opportunity to serve. So until next time, this is Dr. Thomas Lamar. And may God bless you as you diligently pass on a vibrant Christian heritage to your children for God's glory. Good night, everybody, and God bless. on this Christian Heritage program, find them on the internet at christianheritageonline.org. This program is produced by Christian Heritage Home Educators of Washington, copyright 2014. All right, that uh, concludes tonight's webinar. This is, again, officially the Green Room. And uh, for those of you still hanging on, uh, we thank you for joining us again. A great program, uh, Mr. Wayne. I haven't really heard you present a full session before, but that was really encouraging to me. And we're so grateful that you've uh, joined us here tonight. I'm really glad to be able to do it. Thanks, Danny. Appreciate all your hard work and all of your uh, diligence on the 
uh, on the, in the background to make this all come together. Yeah, absolutely. One of the things yeah. that <laughs> there was a lot going on <laughs> that you guys don't know about. <laughs> <laughs> I have about uh, 15 screens going on over here, and I think I think you managed to see just one of them for most of the broadcast, which is the intent. Um, anyways, one of the things that I just wanted to comment on before we close up here uh, for tonight was I really appreciated uh, one of the practical points that you drove home about uh, kids needing to begin to demonstrate a heart for others uh, before they're really at home immediately now in their current surroundings uh, before they imagine themselves taking on the world in some other country. Uh, not because those are bad aspirations, but because I think that um, God gives us little tests right now. Mm -hmm. And as a young person, we have to make sure that we're faithful in little or else we won't be equipped to be faithful in much. So I appreciated that encouragement. I think we all need to hear that. And I just wanted to echo that to any uh, young people on online right now, which is, we, we, we maybe sometimes get a little claustrophobic in homeschooling. Maybe sometimes we think that our parents are a little too restrictive. Uh, maybe sometimes we feel like spreading our wings. But the truth is uh, we have all the opportunity we need right now to serve God with our heart, soul, and mind. And we need to make the most of that. So uh, I was convicted. I'm going to go home and uh, try to do that better myself and appreciate that encouragement. Amen. Amen. Okay. Well, folks, uh, we hope to see you April 24th through 26th in Redmond, Washington. Uh, again, as a reminder, online registration discounts end next Saturday. So if you are participating in the uh, ambassador program to get a one-third discount on your registration, or you're going to invite a uh, a uh, parent of a preschooler who's never attended before, or you're going to try to get your pastor to attend for the first time. All of those require online registration by April 12th. And uh, if you want to pay more money, you can do that at the door. But we suggest you save a little bit uh, for the vendor hall and uh, register by April 12th. All right. Good night and God bless. Good night, everybody.